it's a part of what I've done that doesn't get as much attention as <laughs> other things. But um, the I wish I could say I decided to be a pioneer and went out and did it as a pioneer. It was that. It was a matter of circumstances and trying to do the best job I could. The, the self-report came about as a result of my master's thesis. That was the, and when I did that, I was taking my techniques and methodology from a study by uh, Jim Short and F. Ivan Nye out in the state of Washington. And they did a self-report study of delinquency uh, and had a number of different variables, family variables, and one was class. And so when I was trying to devise a master's thesis, I said, well, I think I'll take that. I'll copy what they're doing. And I think they're wrong. I think there is a class effect in delinquency. It's just that their study was done in rural Washington state, and I'm going to do it in an urban big city. So I was I planned to go to Akron, Ohio, and do self-report studies among the school kids there. And I did that. I wrote up a proposal. Uh, I went to the superintendent of schools at Akron, talked to him and to a couple of his assistants, and told them what I wanted to do. And they said, oh, okay, you can do it. <laughs> so that's all it took. So I, I got together, I put together a questionnaire based on, on the uh, short and nice study and some adding some stuff in myself. What I, what I wasn't fully aware of at the time was nobody else had done that except for short and, and one other person. So mine was kind of like the, the third self-report study of that kind ever done. Now, there had been some self-reports among college students in, in the classes and stuff like that, but no real community-wide self-report studies of delinquency. And, and so it very quickly, that, that article, I published an article on that uh, when I was at Kentucky working on my doctorate. And that article quickly became very well known and cited a lot. Uh, at one point, it became one of the top 25 cited articles in the field from 1945 to 1970. Uh, and that's simply because it was a new technique, but more people liked it and more people were using it. And they went, so whenever they used it, they would cite they give a string site, it would be me, short nights, somebody else. So uh, it would be John Clark and I and myself. So that's how I became a pioneer on that. Uh, and I and I kept using that technique and I developed, and I used it throughout my career. I used it for all the rest of my research, you know, uh, except for my dissertation research. I, my dissertation research didn't use self-report. Uh, but everything I did after that, uh, my studies of uh, the Boys Town study of drugs and, and alcohol among adolescents, the study of elderly drinking, uh, the study of teenage smoking, uh, all my other studies, I use self-report. Uh, it's common now, you don't, everybody does it, but, uh, and I think they, a lot of them followed what I, what I started. I didn't, didn't anticipate that, I didn't think about that. I was glad to see it happen, but I I was not going to stake my career on self-report to <laughs> but that's what happened. Now, the comparative stuff came about in a similar fashion. Uh, as I told you, when I went to the University of Washington, uh, Burgess and I were working on this difference association reinforcement theory, and I was publishing articles from my dissertation uh, and was uh, teaching criminology and delinquency and having discussions with fellow faculty. And one of those faculty was, a, was a, an old time sociologist named Norman Hainer. He was from the Chicago school. He was from the 1930s. Here he was now, he was in his seventies, but he was still going strong. And he was a master when it came to corrections. He knew prisons inside and out. He knew sociology of corrections. And he had a lot of students who left under his tutelage and went and got jobs in, in the correctional system, being wardens and, and probation officers, stuff like that. So he wanted to do a study of prisons in Mexico and in the United States. Uh, and uh, I won't go through the whole story, but he wound up collaborating with me and I, I worked with him on writing up a proposal 
through the National Institute of Mental Health to do a study of comparative study of prisons and what we call the inmate culture in the United States, Mexico, Spain, Germany, and England. So we have five societies around the world. Nobody had ever done that before. I didn't say to myself, oh boy, nobody's done this before. This is going to be great. I just said, this would be interesting to do. <laughs> uh, and I, and Hainer was, Hainer was such a great guy. Uh, and I learned a lot from him. And it just so happened that I was very well versed in corrections because I had done special readings in grad. I didn't take the course, but I'd done special readings in the sociology of corrections in graduate school. So I, I knew the field. And so with Hainer, uh, we did it and, and we published a number of articles out of that. Now, unfortunately, there hasn't been as much cross-cultural studies as I thought there would be, but there have been some. Uh, now, what has happened in later years is I've had cross-cultural tests of social learning theory. Uh, a lot of them by my students uh, uh, and a lot of by other people, but uh, the social learning theory has now been tested uh, using a lot of times using my questions that I used in the United States. Uh, I had a doctoral student who was from Bolivia and uh, he was very interested in the theory and he wanted to do a study of it in Bolivia. And so we developed a questionnaire. He went back to Bolivia for a while, <laughs> collected samples on university students and came back and it was a great study. Uh, I've had students in uh, Korea, two actually, three, three actually in Korea, do cross-cultural studies of it. Uh, I've had, I had one student who was from uh, uh, Taiwan and I had other students who were from, I had one, I had not, a student wasn't from China, but I had one doctoral student who did a cross-cultural study of social learning in China. She got a hold of a data set. I don't know where it, where it was, but she got a hold of a data set and, and it had some measures in there that would kind of work for social learning. So, uh, and uh, Iran, Turkey, I mean, I, there, there's, a, there's a guy in, in Iran called uh, uh, Akmar Alavardina, and he's a great sociologist and he's hooked on to social learning there and he's done some studies of it in Iran and it works there too. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I, one of the criticism of it was, well, it, you know, this is, this works in the U.S., but it won't work any place else. Yes, it does work other places. And sometimes as well as in the U.S., sometimes not as well, but it always works. And then I always, I, I always say, but you have to ask, compared to what? What other perspectives do a better job? What other perspectives do a better job of comparing across societies? Now, what that tells me is that there's bound to be some effect of, of different cultures. There has to be. But the basic learning process and the basic behavioral process should be the same all over the world. Should be the same. That's my idea. And so far, it looks like it is. <laughs> so that's how I got into the, into the cross-cultural comparison. You're right. It, uh, people don't pay as much attention to that. But, but I, thought, I found it interesting and exciting to do it. 